12.01, so why don't we go ahead and get started? Good morning, everyone. The time is now 12.01 p.m., and I will call the meeting of the District of Columbia Board of Ethics and Government Accountability to order. I am Norma Hutchison, the Vega Chairperson, and due to COVID-19, this meeting is being held virtually via WebEx. Joining me today for this meeting are board members Charles Nottingham. Oh, I have not seen, actually, I have not seen him either. Well, joining me are Melissa Tucker and Darren Sobin, and the three of us constitute uh, a quorum. I'm expecting Mr. Nottingham and, and Ms. Smith shortly. Uh, since it was first posted, the meeting agenda has not been changed in any way. So I ask that you please take a minute to review the agenda. I just wanted to note that I'm I'm here. I'm okay, here. I know that Ms. Smith is Police. here. Police yes. Smith is here. And I'm still I do not see Mr. Nottingham, but I'm sure he's he'll be joining us, hopefully. So if you've had a minute to review the agenda, will someone please make a motion to adopt the agenda for today's meeting? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we adopt the agenda for today's meeting. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Anyone else? Ms. Smith and Ms. Oh, Ms. I Tucker? said aye. This is Ms. Okay, Smith. Okay, I'm sorry. Just, okay. Anyone opposed to adopting the agenda? Now, hearing none, the board has adopted the agenda for today's meeting. The first order of business before us is the um, January 2020 draft meeting minutes. And please take a minute to review those, and then I'll need a member to make a motion to um, consider the approval of the minutes. I'll offer that motion. Okay, so there's a motion to approve. Okay, great. Second, uh, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposition to adopting, uh, approving the minutes from the January 6, 2022 meeting? Okay, hearing none, the board approves the January 6, 2022 meeting minutes. The next item on the agenda is the report from the Office of Open Government. We'll next hear from Director Nikel Allen, who'll provide the report on behalf of the office, and Ms. Allen is appearing via WebEx. Ms. Allen, please proceed. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson Hutchison and members of the board. Um, I am Nikel Allen, Director of Open Government. And I'm pleased to present this report on the activities of the Office of Open Government. Since the last board meeting, the Office of Open Government has continued to fulfill its mission of ensuring that all persons receive full and complete information regarding the affairs of the District of Columbia government and the actions of those who represent them. I'll start with Open Meetings Act advice and Freedom of Information and Act advice rendered by the office. Um, first, advisory opinions. On February 2nd, 2022, I issued an advisory opinion resolving an Open Meetings Act complaint concerning the District of Columbia Housing Authority Board of Commissioners, which is complaint number OOG-2021-003-M. The complaint alleged that the DC Housing Authority Board of Commissioners, or DCHA, violated the Open Meetings Act by improperly following emergency meeting procedures and meeting in closed session without providing the proper public notice. The complaint was in regard to an emergency meeting held on May 27, 2021. The Office of Open Government's legal staff investigated the matter and based, their find, on, and based on their findings and analysis, I concluded that DCHA's May 27, 2021 emergency meeting notice violated the Open Meetings Act because it failed to state that DCHA would enter into a closed session and the meeting notice did not state the reason for closure under DC Official Code Section 2-575B. 
I found that their emergency meeting did not comply with DC official code section 2-577D that requires a chairperson to make oral representations about the emergency meeting because the DCHA chairman did not state how the emergency meeting notice was circulated to the public and the DCHA chairman also failed to state the nature of the emergency in the beginning of the meeting. Last, I found that DCHA's primary reason for the closed session was statutorily permissible under the Open Meetings Act personnel exemption. So DCHA did not violate the Open Meetings Act when it actually met in closed session to appoint an interim director and to form a committee to search for its new executive director. Um, the next item is informal Open Meetings Act and FOIA advice. I had a quick question before you move on to the next one. Um, first of all, I thought it was a, a really well written opinion and it made a lot of sense to me. And I noticed you did not buy the harmless error argument. Is that correct? That's correct. <laughs> yes. I wasn't sure if they thought we were a sitting court of appeals or something like that, but that I don't think I had heard that one before. Anyway. <laughs> not, yes. Um, yeah, harmless harmless error doesn't cut it. <laughs> right. Yes. Um, the, the public, especially, you know, given on the nature of what they do. Um, to, to, to them to follow the Open Meetings Act. Uh, so yes, it was not harmless error. <laughs> um, and so, so the next um, item is informal Open Meetings Act and FOIA advice. Um, since the last board meeting, the Office of Open Government responded informally via email or telephone to requests for assistance as follows. Um, the OOG responded to 12 requests for Open Meetings Act advice we responded to nine requests for FOIA advice, and we responded to 29 requests for technical assistance with open-dc.gov. Um, the next item I report on is training and outreach. Um, the Office of Attorney General's training on uh, January 22nd, Attorney DeBerry and Attorney Orgy attended the Human Trafficking Awareness Training presented by the Office of the Attorney General. The training discussed the types of trafficking most prevalent in the District of Columbia, how to spot potential trafficking concerns, what to do if trafficking concerns arise, and what OAG is doing to combat human trafficking. The training offered participants an opportunity to learn ways to combat this horrific crime at work and in the community. Um, next, the DC Commission on Arts and Humanities Open Meetings Act meeting. On January 12, 2022, Chief Counsel Barton and Attorney DeBerry met remotely with members of the Committee on Arts and Humanities to discuss the applicability of the Open Meetings Act to a specific commission event. The meeting included instruction on the Open Meetings Act, open, opening of the meeting, notice of the meeting, and recording of the meeting provisions. Open Government Coalition meeting. On January 12, 2022, Chief, Barton, Chief Counsel Barton and I met remotely with the leadership of the Open Government Coalition to discuss open government issues. We heard from them regarding the organization's legislative priorities respecting FOIA. We also discussed FOIA virtual meetings in the Sunshine Week 2022. Law Right Consulting Legal Writing Solutions. On January 14th, I, along with the OOG staff and members of the OGE staff, attended a legal writing workshop. The workshop trained attorneys to produce work product that serves the need of a busy, busy, easily distracted, and skeptical readers. The workshop discussed primary principles that guide the process of thinking and writing in a lawyerly manner. Um, next, Conflict of Laws, Washington University. On January 18, 2022, Attorney Weil began a Conflict of Laws class at the Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. The Conflict of Laws class considers three questions. What law applies to cases connected to one, um, more than one state or county choice of law? What courts have the authority to decide such cases, jurisdictions, and what is the effect elsewhere of a court's decision in such cases, recognition of judgments? Attorney Weil will be attending the cases virtually through April 2022. District employees and student loans navigating public service loans forgiveness and managing repayment. On uh, January 20th, 2022, Attorney Orji attorney attended the Office of um, the Attorney General's Office of Consumer Protection Training, which provided information on the public service loan forgiveness and time limited waiver program. The training provided support to student loan borrowers with tools and tips on how to navigate and adequately prepare for repayment. 
The training provided resources to district residents to prepare for the resumption of student loan payments in May 2022. OAG training virtual trials. On January 26, 2022, Chief Counsel Barton attended the Office of Open Government, I'm sorry, the Office of the Attorney General virtual trials best practices on preparation and execution training. The training provided the best practices on preparing and conducting trials and administrative hearings remotely and provided tips to improving the quality of all remote meetings. FOIA advisory opinion request meeting. On January 27, 2022, I, along with Senior Attorney Advisor Tran, Chief Counsel Barton, um, and Attorney Advisor Barry met, um, DeBerry, excuse me, met remotely with the District of Columbia Department of Transportation FOIA officers to hear a response to a request for a FOIA advisory opinion alleging a violation of FOIA fee charging provisions by DDOT. The meeting was at DDOT's request to clarify the issue and provide an oral response to the response to the complaint allegations. DDOT will respond to um, the complaint and provide OOG with a written response for the record. Um, the next is a meeting with the DC Com Council Committee on Human Services Council. On January 28th, I, along with Senior Attorney Advisor Lynn Tran, met with Nikita Easley, the DC Council Committee on Human Services Council regarding the agency's performance oversight hearing, which will occur on February 22nd. We discussed the Office of Open Government's legislative and budgetary priority. Legislatively, we went over the recommendations the board included in the best practices report. Our key recommendation, as you know, it was to include an advisory neighborhood commission uh, meetings in the um, Open Meetings Act. From a budgetary standpoint, we discussed our enhancement request for a paid legal fellow and provided an update on um, the office relocation. Um, the next item is the DC Public Charter School Board Open Meetings Act training. On January 28th, Attorney Orji conducted an Open Meetings Act training as a result of advisory opinion number um, zero, excuse me, OOG dash. Uh, 2021-001M for the DC Public Charter School Board. One out of the four board members was able to attend that meeting. This is the first training of a two-part training for that board. The next training for the board members is scheduled for February 2022. Um, Vegas Monthly Brown Bag Forum on January 31st, 2022, Attorney DeBerry participated in Vegas Virtual Brown Bag Ethics Forum as a facilitator. Her presentation discussed OOG's role to advise and educate the public and public bodies on the Open Meetings Act and DC FOIA. Um, the next item is the legislation and litigation update. Um, first is litigation. Um, Tamel Dubose lawsuit regarding the Board of Dentistry Resumes, Experts, Complaints, and Decisions. On January 20th, 2018, Tamel Dubose DDS sued the district under DC FOIA, seeking certain records from the Board of Dentistry, alleging um, while challenging the assessment of fees. This matter remains with the DC Court of Appeals. The court heard oral argument on November 20, 30th, 2021, and a disposition is pending. Um, the next case is Washington Post lawsuit regarding requests arising out of the Capitol riot. On June 23rd, 2021, the Washington Post legal entity, Washington Post Company LLC, sued the district and the um, Superior Court of the District of Columbia for declaratory and injunctive relief. On January 21st, 2022, the court conducted a status hearing and a hearing on the district's motion to dismiss. The court dismissed the post claim number one because the district satisfied the post FOIA request with respect to email records. The court declined to dismiss the claim with respect to WhatsApp messages because the district search and explanation of that search were inadequate to meet its burden under DC FOIA. There is a new status hearing set for April 8th, 2022. The complaint, the district's partial motion to dismiss, the party's supporting memoranda, and the court's order partially granting the district's motion to dismiss are uploaded to Dropbox. The next case is Judicial Watch lawsuits regarding autopsy record records. On March 19th, 2021 and May 4th, 2021, Judicial Watch Incorporated filed complaints in DC Superior Court seeking specific performance and appealing the denials of DC FOIA requests from the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner and the Metropolitan Police Department. 
the requested records relate to the breach of the Capitol on January 6, 2021. On January 19, 2022, the parties filed a joint status report and the district filed its answer to the conciliated complaint. In their joint status report, the party stated the district has produced records and indices describing 374 withheld and with redacted records. As a result of these efforts, the parties have successfully narrowed the issues to be addressed by the court. Judicial Watch does not challenge the reasonableness of the district's search for records responsive to Judicial Watch requests. Judicial Watch also does not challenge all the records being withheld in full or in part. Judicial Watch only challenges the 89 withheld records and redacted records identified in the accompanying exhibits. The parties further agreed to a limit on attorney's fees to a briefing schedule subject to Judge Williams' approval, beginning with the district's motion for summary judgment to be, get, be due on March 4th. A scheduling conference in that case remains set for February 4th. Um, the last case is the Phillips lawsuit challenging an MPD watch list. On February 2nd, 2022, criminal defense lawyer Amy Phillips sued the district in, Uni in the United States District Court under Section 1979 of the Federal Revised Statutes, commonly called Section 1983. This statute contains a right of action for private citizens to sue for civil rights violations, including breaches of constitutional rights. Phillips alleges that the Metropolitan Police Department has subjected her and will subject her in the future to delays, burdens, and denial of her DC FOIA requests that are unique to her because her work product and anticipated work product has the potential to, and in fact did, embarrass the Metropolitan Police Department. Phillips alleges that MPD maintains a watch list of those who use DC FOIA requests to the detriment of the MPD. Once the list, the requesters once on the list, the requesters face hurdles that the general public avoids. They may be charged money for public information that other gets for free. They may have their request delayed, or they may have their rights denied outright. Phillips attached a declaration of former FOIA officer. Inspector Vendette Parker, who's retired, concerning an unofficial, unwritten policy that required the FOIA officer to notify the chief of police, the chief operating officer of any FOIA requests originating from the media, certain identified individuals, or requests for certain records. The chief operating officer made it clear that I should bring to her attention any request coming from a person that he previously published, that had previously published negative media, media articles about former Chief Newsham or the police department. If he uses the records for litigation or if he's outspoken in the city council or community meetings in a negative way towards former Chief Newsham or MPD, the requester is the subject of a high profile incident or if he repeatedly re requests records that have the potential to be detrimental to former Chief Newsham or MPD, regardless of whether or not what is currently being requested is potentially detrimental. This is a quote from um, the um, Inspector Parker's declaration, um, and it names Phillips as one of the affected individuals. Phillips asserts that this watch list treatment unconstitutionally abridges her freedom of speech. Um, in the lawsuit, Phillips seeks an injunction requiring the district to cease its policy of unfavorable treatment of certain FOIA cases and of FOIA requesters and um, instead treat all FOIA requests in a material identical fashion without regard to the content or viewpoint of the requesters prior to anticipated speech. Um, a declaratory judgment that's in the district, that the district's policy of unfavorable treatment of certain requests or requesters violates the Constitution and any fees and nominal damages. Um, an article discussing the case, the complaint, and its exhibit are in. Um, Dropbox for your information. Um, OOG staff will continue to monitor um, these cases. And I'll just say something um, about this case. It was just filed yesterday. I just found out about it this morning. Um, of course, you know, we're very disturbed to learn um, about this. Um, I always found um, retired inspector Parker to be very cooperative um, with with this office. Um, you know, we will closely follow this case. I'm, I'm interested um to find out 
um, if any of these allegations are in fact um, true, it's very disturbing um, um, to hear that um, that this may be may have occurred. Um, the, the article, which is in Dropbox, seems to suggest that it may still be occurring. I hope it is is not. Um, it's again eerily similar um, to what was was hap what was proven to be happening at um, the Department of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs, which you know led to the dismissal of a, a former director, and and, um, and that came out through a, as you may recall, a a whistleblower case from um, their their FOIA officer. Um, so when we hear about those things, they are of course disturbing. We do not um, have any authority to, to do anything um, about that other than you know recommend that they do not do that because it flies against um, the implementation of FOIA. Uh, but you know again, we, we strongly um, suggest to the executive that you know these things do not happen. Again, it, it just falls and flies in a place of um, government transparency. I was just curious, did this individual, this plaintiff ever reach out to you guys? No, she did not. Um, the, the article, um, I, I believe the um, FOIA officer in this case, it suggests she reached out to OAG. The, the, which, um, we've, this is the first time I'm hearing, I'm hearing of this. Uh, she never mentioned it um, to me or um, in my dealings with her that this was going on. But it's very disheartening to to hear, you know, especially coming from, um, you know, MPD is is important that you know they their operations in particular when when it comes to FOIA are transparent. Just given the importance um, of the public, just being able to have confidence um, in their operations in that area, and you know, they it's just. One step forward, two step back. So you know, I will maintain an open mind because you know at this point it's a lawsuit and these are allegations. Um, you know, I will you know, accept monitor this and we'll, we'll see if they make any statements. Again, you know, this this lawsuit was just filed yesterday. I'm not aware that they've made any any public statements about it yet. Uh, but we will make sure to let you know um, if, if any public statements come out of um, current MPD. Of course, these allegations are with the former um, police chief. But again, very disturbing. Um, so the, the next item is the legislation, um, protection of the federal judge's privacy, um, Daniel Andrell Judicial Security and Privacy Act of 2021. Um, on July 19th, 2020, an assailant targeted the home of a U.S. District Court judge impersonating a delivery driver. He apparently availed himself of personally identifying information from the internet, knocked on a judge's door, and when the door opened, shot and killed the judge's son and wounded her husband. On September 24th and October 13th, 2020, the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives, respectively, uh, members introduced the Daniel Andrell Judicial Security and Privacy Act of 2020. According to the Congressional Research Services Summary, this bill addresses the security of federal judges and their immediate family. The federal agencies may not publicly post a protected individual's PII. Furthermore, upon receiving a written request, the agency must within 72 hours remove any such information that has already been posted grant to state and local governments help pre prevent the release of PII. Additionally, data brokers may not sell the PII of a protected individual upon receiving a written request from a protected individual. A private party shall not publicly disclose PII relating to the individual and must remove any such information that's already posted on the internet. A companion measure was reintroduced in this Congress on December 10th, 20, I'm sorry, on December 2nd, 2021, the Senate Judicial Judiciary Committee considered its version and reported it out with an amendment in the nature of a substitute. The newest version um, of the measure is available in Dropbox. It contains um, considerable edits from the original version. Um, other legislation, a committee of the National Uniform Law Commission is drafting a public meetings during Emergencies Act the committee will meet on April 22nd and April 23rd, 2022. 
the OOG staff will continue to matter, monitor this and other legislative activity. Um, the last um, item in my report, report is administrative matters, and I only have one item to report, and it's the paralegal specialist position. The paralegal specialist position vacancy has been forwarded to DCHR and will be posted on their website next week. The position vacancy will be advertised for 60 days. And this concludes the Office of Open Government's February 3rd, 2022 report. Thank you, Director Allen. Are there any other questions or comments on Director Allen's report? I will note that Director Nottingham joined us right as, as um, Director Allen was starting her report, so he's with us. We have a full complement of directors for this meeting. Any questions, comments? Okay. Then the next item on the agenda is the report from the Office of Government Ethics. Also via WebEx, Director Ashley Cooks will provide the report on behalf of the Office of Government Ethics. Good afternoon, Chairperson. Cooks, please proceed. Can you hear me? Okay. Good afternoon, Chairperson. Yes, Hutchison. we can hear you. All right, thanks. Good afternoon, Chairperson Hutchison and members of the board. I'm Ashley Cooks, the Director of Government Ethics. I'm pleased to present this report on the activities of the Office of Government Ethics, OGE. First, update on status of OGE operations. The information reported today regarding OGE's cases will not reflect any status changes that may occur as a result of actions taken by the board during today's meeting. First, open investigations by status. We have 48 open investigations, one matter that is uh, pending negotiations, one matter pending a show cause hearing for a grand total of 50 cases. Next, we have two, we have a grand total of two undocumented matters. Pending state investigations by status, we have 25 matters that are closed pending collection, four matters that are closed pending, pending DC Superior Court case, five matters that are stayed for OAG False Claims Act case, eight matters stayed pending an OIG investigation, Two matters stay pending, um, excuse, excuse me, stayed for a pending U.S. District Court case for a grand total of 44 matters. For regulatory matters by status, we have 23 matters that are closed pending collection, 22 matters that are open for a grand total of 45 matters. We currently have 50 open, 50 open investigations and 15 stayed matters. Uh, the number of open preliminary and formal investigations includes six new matters open since the last board meeting. The investigative team resolved nine investigations and dismissed nine undocumented matters since the last meeting. Next is training and outreach. First, professional development trainings attended by staff. OGE staff took advantage of the following professional development trainings. Attorney Advisor Eccles completed human trafficking awareness training, legal writing skills training, and virtual trials, best practices on preparation and execution presented by the Office of the Attorney General. Administrative Officer Tyrell Dow completed management supervisory service time entry and management supervisory service time approval. Auditor Tajuba completed First, uh, number one, virtual team management and team building, which provided an overview of strategies to manage virtual teams effectively, including learning tactics for psych psychological secrets of persuasion and communication that influence team members' behavior. Two, fraud updates, which provided information to auditors concerning the crucial role of their fiduciary responsibilities. Three, internal control for businesses, which is a key input provider in developing cost-effective internal control for businesses that increases efficiency of business. And four, understanding, detecting, and preventing cash, credit card, inventory, and payroll fraud, which explored the understanding of fraud and cash and credit card frauds in detail. Supervisory Attorney Stuart Mitchell and Attorney Jones attended virtual trials best practices on preparation and execution presented by the Office of the Attorney General. Senior Attorney Tran and I attended the Campaign Legal Center's webinar, Fostering Public Trust, 
how to make ethics commissions more transparent, accessible, and accountable in 2022. We both attended the Bribery and Illegal Influence Crimes webinar, which was the second session of the DC Bar's Anti-Corruption Series. The session featured a panel discussion on prosecuting and defending bribery cases involving public officials. Panelists discussed the elements of a bribery offense, fact patterns associated with bribery of public officials in all three branches of the government, as well as special considerations such as the speech and debate, debate legislative privilege and judicial deliberative privilege. Lastly, I was invited to join the DC Bar's John Payton Leadership Academy class of 2022. The Leadership Academy is an intensive and interactive learning experience taught, excuse me, designed and taught by lawyers, which focuses on the essential leadership skills that resonate in the leader in the legal profession. The program covers a variety of leadership skills, such as inspiring others, creating a vision, defining success, setting goals, building trust, communicating effectively, building relationships, and working with others to bring out the best in people and organizations. The Academy will include several virtual meetings until May, 2022. Next are um, trainings conducted by staff. Since the last board meeting, OGE attorneys conducted six ethics trainings, which included the monthly training, boards and commissions trainings for the Developmental Disability Council, ethics training for the Office of the Attorney General's Rough Fellows Orientation, and two Hatch Act trainings. On January 12th, Attorney Advisor Eccles and Program Specialist Kozik offered a virtual lobbying training entitled Lobbyist Code and Policy Review, LRRE File Training. Mr. Kozik also conducted a training regarding how to complete filings using our lobbyist e-filing system for the staff of Sibley Medical Center. On this past Monday, we hosted our first Ethics Counselor Virtual Brown Bag Session of 2022. The topic was the Vega Advice Process. Supervisory Attorney Stuart Mitchell provided information on how and when to seek ethics advice, the types of ethics advice we offer, and OGE's internal processes for providing advice. Office of Open Government Attorney Cherie DeBerry provided information on OOG's jurisdiction, and advice giving process. 56 employees completed our online ethics training via PeopleSoft. Next is outreach. The Campaign Legal Center CLC is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that utilizes legislation, policy, and advocacy, communication, and partnerships to achieve results of a more transparent, accountable, and inclusive democracy. CLC recently issued its transparency upgrades for ethics commissions report. The purpose of the report is to provide state and local ethics commissions with innovative transparency solutions to improve how they effectively implement their ethics programs. Specifically, the project highlights proven transparency upgrades that ethics commissions have used to better educate and advise ethics officials, engage and inform the public, and enforce the law against the against the non-compliant. By interviewing nine ethics commissions, CLC identified 10 tools that ethics commissions can implement to promote those goals. The 10 tools are a dashboard of public disclosures, heat map of enforcement actions, educational content for social media, a complaint portal, searchable and downloadable public disclosures, advanced search of advisory opinions, online ethics advice, public virtual hearings, e-newsletters, and a citizen-minded homepage. I am pleased to announce that we are currently implementing some of the tools outlined in the report. On February 4th, Senior Attorney Tran and I are scheduled to meet with the staff of CLC to discuss how we can implement the additional recommendations and how to improve our existing tools. A copy of the CLC report was uploaded to the Dropbox for your review. Next is advisory opinions and advice. Um, for informal advice, OGE's legal staff provided advice for approximately 25 ethics inquiries, which is five more than the 20 reported at the January meeting. This number does not include responses that we have provided to questions regarding the lobbyists 
and FDS e-filing systems. OGE has not drafted any advisory opinions since the last board meeting. Next is legislation updates. The Central Collection Unit, CCU, within the Office of the Chief Financial Officer, recently informed OGE that pursuant to the Delinquent Debt Recovery Act of 2012, Debt Recovery Act, government agencies are required by law to forward, forward any uncollected debt that is 90 days, that is over 90 days to the CCU, and that debts collected by the CCU on behalf of beggar are to be deposited into the, the district's general fund. OGE asserts that the council intended for fines and delinquent debt resulting from ethics violations to be deposited into the ethics fund. OGE discussed this matter with Councilmember Nadeau's office and has recommended amending the Debt Recovery Act to include language that beggar may, in its discretion, transfer and refer delinquent debt associated with settlements and judgments to the CCU for collection and funds collected shall be deposited into the ethics fund. A copy of the draft amendment was placed in the drop box for your review. Next is OGE administrative matters. Uh, excuse me. First is OGE staffing. I'm pleased to announce that Millicent Jones is the newest attorney advisor to join OGE. She has an extensive career working in DC government, which began in 2013 when she served as the consent de decree special compliance specialist at the Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services, where she successfully assisted in depart agency departments to meet various legal compliance goals. In 2017, Ms. Jones joined DC's Office of the Attorney General and the Juvenile Section of the Public Safety Division. There, she prosecuted misdemeanor and major felony cases from inception to disposition, evaluated the sufficiency of cases, and served as a, served as a mentor to junior attorneys in the office. Ms. Jones is a native Marylander who enjoys reading, traveling, and spending time with her family. Welcome, Millicent. Also, OGE is still working with the Department of Human Resources to post vacancy announcement for a human resources specialist and program support assistance. Next is the budget on November 4th, 2021. Exec, uh, excuse me, Director Allen and I submitted Vegas 2023 budget submission to the Executive Office of the Mayor. The submission included budget enhancement requests for office relocation, legal fellows, a supervisory investigator, public information officer, and OOG's reclassifications. There are no updates at this time. Next is financial disclosure statement, FDS. The FDS team is preparing for the 2022 filing season. A OGE has issued the FDS memorandum to agency heads, confirmed the list of, ethics, of agency ethics counselors, and scheduled FDS trainings. Financial disclosure e-file system update upgrades are still in progress. The FDS team has met with the contractor abstract evolutions at least once per week since January 1st. These meetings are designed for the vendor to ask in-depth questions regarding the system's current functionality and how to achieve the desired outcomes. The upgrades will improve reporting for advisory Advisory neighborhood commissioners require an e-signature for all filers and increase editing controls for OGE staff. The FDS team continues to work on the financial disclosure statement, stamp, excuse me, financial disclosure standard operating procedures manual. Lastly, the Office of Pay and Retirement Services is processing the 2021 fines for those confidential filers who failed to timely submit their FDS form. Okay, lob next is lobbying, registration, and reporting, LRR. The 2022 registrations and 2021 quarter four activity reports were due January 18th. OGE received 393 total registrations, which included 15 new registrations, 378 renewals, and 12 terminations. In addition to the registrations and terminations, we received 467 activity reports. On January 4th, to, excuse me, January 24th, 2002, 
OGE sent three enforcement letters for two late activity reports and one late registration filing to lobbyists. Auditor Tajuba completed the lobbyist and registrant reduced fee eligibility, eligibility audit, which reviews a registrant's eligibility to, to file as a 501c3 entity and pay a reduced lobby and registration fee. The audit is under review by the LRR team. Lastly, Program Specialist Kozik prepared a report detailing the lobbyist registration and activity report trends since the implementation of the e-filing system. A copy was placed in the Dropbox for your review. And last is uh, formal investigations. We have one formal public investigation that is 22-0002F, Henry Neil Albert. This matter is a formal investigation pursuant to DC Official Code Section 1-1162.12B and is based on allegations that the respondent, former chairperson of the DC Housing Authority's Board of Commissioners, voted to award contracts to Moya Design Partners and failed to disclose a close personal relationship with the owner of Moya Design. OG is continuing its efforts to investigate this matter by gathering evidence and interviewing witnesses. Thank you. This concludes the Office of Government Ethics, February 3rd, 2022 report. Thank you, Director Cooks. Are there any questions or comments for Director Cooks? I also want to welcome um, Ms. Ms. Jones to Vega. It's good to have you. Any other questions or comments? Just a congratulations uh, for being accepted to the John Payton Leadership Academy at the DC Bar. That is one of the DC Bar's signature programs, and it is um, it is very prestigious. Not only um, graduate from it, but to get into it in the first place. So congratulations. Uh, and Director Nickel, I hope to see you there next year also. Thank you. Madam Chair, I just want to also add my um, warm welcome to our um, newest attorney. Thank you for joining us. And just a quick question. I know that there's probably not much that can be said um, about any current investigation, but I know there's there seems to be a lot of public interest in the in Ray Neil Albert matter is that just as far as status is there a ballpark guesstimate as to when you might have something more to um to be able to share with the public um on that uh, on that investigation and if not no worries i just um, just want to make sure people know that we're leaning forward and and working on it diligently but i'm sure you are so um it is a public matter so we can share some things about the case without interfering with the investigation. Um, so the team has conducted several interviews um, and has done a great job gathering um, the evidence that we need to um, prove, well, to find out if there is a, an actual conflict of interest here. Um, but I anticipate, we anticipate that we would have, we may have an NOV or a disposition to present to the board at the next board meeting. Great, thank you very much. Okay, any other questions? Okay, hearing none, I'll move to the next item one on the agenda, that's public comments. The public was invited to submit comments in writing by 11 a.m. today. Um, those comments would become a part of the record for this meeting. However, no comments were, were received. The executive, executive um, session, closed session, is the next item on our agenda. And this item is a closed session to discuss ongoing confidential investigations pursuant to DC Official Code Section 2-575B14 to consult with an attorney to obtain legal advice and to preserve the attorney-client privilege between an attorney and a public body pursuant to DC Official Code Section 2-575B4A, to discuss personnel matters, including the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, performance, evaluation, compensation, discipline, demotion, removal, or resignation of government appointees, employees, or officials, pursuant to DC Official Code Section 2-575B10, 
to deliberate on a decision in which the ethics board will exercise quasi-judicial functions pursuant to DC official code section 2-575B13 and to discuss contract negotiation strategies pursuant to DC official code section 2-575B2. May I have a motion to enter executive session? I'll offer the motion that we enter into executive session. I'll second that motion. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that the board enter into executive session. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Okay, any opposition? Hearing none, board members, please log out of this session and log into the WebEx for the executive session. And once the executive session is over, we will return to this WebEx to report out any matters decided, finish any other business, and to adjourn the meeting. Okay, thank you.
Okay, the time is now 1.08 p.m. And we are back on the record. The board has approved two matters to report out. The first is the board approved the motion to dismiss matter 19-0001-F in Ray L. Moore. The board um, approved dismissal and is closing the file on that one. The board also approved a negotiated disposition in the matter of 20-0003-F in uh, Ray H. Aida. Um, the board has uh, again approved the negotiated disposition in that matter. Okay. With that, the board, this concludes the meeting of the DC Board of Government Accountability for February 2022. Our next meeting will be held via WebEx on March 3rd, 2022 at 12 noon. Thank you all for your participation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Have a great holiday. Take care. Take care. Thank you.